we read a little bit ago those three verses from Joshua chapter 1. I want to talk about the choosing of the Lord, the command of the leader, and the choice of the people after I go to the Lord in prayer once again. Our Heavenly Father, as we read Your Word, it's always a blessing. And there's always a lesson. There's something You're teaching us, something You're showing us, something we need to look at in our lives. And this morning, those three verses are no different. Your Word is quick and powerful. And it does work our hearts. It works in our life. Father, I pray that this morning we will open the door to our heart and let Your Word in. And when we leave a little later, we just don't open that door again and leave it sitting in the pew. That we will take Your Word with us and use it in these coming days. So Father, be with us now during this time. Pray that You would help keep the things of the world out of our mind, that we can focus on You. And I know that the devil is going to work as hard as he can to keep us from hearing Your Word. But we need to remember that greater is He that is within us that is in the world. And we know that the Holy Spirit will enlighten everything that we hear and use it. And we pray as always in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, last week, it seemed like it's been forever since I've been in the pulpit because the revival started last week. And I needed that, as everybody does. People may not understand that pastors need to be fed just like everyone else. But the last time we were here, as we get, went through the, going through the book of Joshua, Joshua had talked with the Lord, and he had come back and had given some commands to the people. And in this account that Joshua had with God, he's called to be the leader of the nation of Israel. And he's going to the people in response to that and giving them commands. You know, even a chosen leader, though, is a follower. Joshua had someone he needed to follow. He was dedicated to following the Lord. And a leader chosen by God must have certain qualifications. First, the one called of God for leadership has to be in tune with God. Now, most of us here remember the old days when you got into the car or you had the radio at home. You had to be so precise. Remember when you had to dial that in or on the, the phone, on the uh, car? And, and if you didn't get it right on the station, you got static. You weren't tuned in to that station. You know, we live in a world now, everything's digital, and you just push a button and numbers come up. But if you're not tuned in just right, you get static. And the same is for the leader that's called of God. If he's not tuned in to the Lord completely, he is not going to follow the Lord in his leading. And every single Christian has the right to expect godly leadership. Godly leadership must have at its core the Word of God and a leader that is obedient to the Word of God. There's absolutely no room for a leader with a double standard, especially a, a Christian leader. He cannot have a double standard. He can't live one, say one thing and live another. It's a hypocrite, two-faced. Can't do that. You can believe me when I tell you that the people of the world are watching Christians. They watch them closely. They hear what you say, but they get more out of what you do and how you live. Words without the backup of pro proper living, they're useless. They're worthless. So a leader called of God must be aware that his witness is his life. Not his words, his life. Anybody can say the right words, There'll be people who come and knock on your door and they'll say the right words. They don't mean what you think they mean, but they say the right words. It's the life that's important. And every Christian leader, whether he's a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, a deacon, whatever, must have a life that reflects a humble dependence upon God. And he must live in a humble relationship with other leaders. A Christian leader, by the way, cannot be jealous because another pastor has a church of 5,000. That doesn't bother me. You shouldn't be jealous if the fellow down the street leads 20 people to the Lord today. You shouldn't be jealous. You should be rejoicing. There's no room for jealousy. We're on the same team. And yet I see that sometimes. 
There's conflict. There's jealousy. And the world sees that. We need to rejoice at people coming to the Lord. We need to aid our brothers and sisters, but there should never be any jealousy. As a matter of fact, every Christian should rejoice when they hear of someone coming to salvation. But what Joshua did was very important for us. You see, when he had his encounter with God, he listened to what God had to say. That's important. We don't always listen. We go to the Lord and we make our list of demands. We take our little sheet there and we tell Him what we want. But we don't always listen to what He responds. No, He's not going to have that deep voice that you hear and echoes through the house and you won't see bright lights. But He will answer that still small voice. But you have to listen to it. And Joshua did that. There are many times we don't listen to anyone, including the Lord. We want it our way or no way. So Joshua was tuned in to the Word of God. And a leader must listen to the Lord before he can instruct the people about what the Lord says. If you don't listen, how can you tell them? You can't. The second thing that a leader, in this case Joshua, is qualified by being able to and willing to make and take a tough stand. Joshua was not unsure of his position. He didn't delay in doing what God called him to do. He recognized the moment and he did not make excuses. He went straight to do it. You remember when Moses was called, he made excuses. And he eventually did what God wanted him to do. And we're good at making excuses. But see, Joshua, listening to God, understood that the time had come for the people to move into the promised land. It was then or never. God had spoken it. And so as a good leader, he issued the command to move forward in obedience to the direction of God. Leaders need to take that firm position to follow the Lord and His commands. But that does not imply aggressive behavior when it comes out of insecurity or pride. Joshua was secure because he had heard God and he knew God and what God wanted him to do. Forty years had passed. A great deal of planning had already been made. You can be sure that over those 40 years that Moses and Joshua had talked about going into the land. And you can be sure for 40 years Moses had talked to the Lord about that. And of course those 40 years they knew was going to pass until that generation who refused to go had died off. You see, what we have here is the fact that a leader plans for the future to the leading of the Lord and in accordance to His will. A godly leader always understands that everything he does, everything he plans is subject to the will of God. He understands, Joshua understood something that wasn't going to be written for quite some time. James 4.15 For thee ought, ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. And so all the plans that they, they're making up until this point is, if God wills, we're going into the promised land. If God wills, we will conquer that land. If God wills, we're going to go out those doors and win people for Christ. You see, a godly leader plans with a clear understanding that it must be within the will of the Lord. But there comes a moment when the leader must take that plan, that preparation stage, and turn it into the action stage. For 40 years, those plans had been about entering the promised land, and now the time had come. Oh, they had reached the point of no return. It was time to place God's perfect plan into action. This is the very moment when the leader is the most vulnerable. True leadership, even when it's practiced by the most mature and emotionally stable person, always exacts a toll on that person. He gets beaten down. He gets weary. And he's vulnerable now. He's made all these plans. He's spoken with the Lord and the time had come now to move forward. You know, in our world, it seems that to be self-evident that the greater the achievement, the higher price to be paid. 
And the same is true for Christian leadership. Jesus Himself seemed to give this, had this thought in mind over in Luke 9.24 when He says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. In other words, if you really want to find your life, you must lose it. There might be a high price to pay for following the Lord. That plan that you have is now purposed. Time for action. There may be a high price. There was probably a price to pay while you were planning and now it could be even more so. How much is a person willing to put forth in hard work and sweat for the cause of Christ? I want to give you some painful aspects of leadership. Every leader must expect criticism. It's just part of the territory. I had a pastor friend who resigned to take another church. He told me, he said, I never knew how many enemies I had until I resigned. Criticism comes. And every leader must expect it. Fatigue is to be expected by the good leader. And he must learn how to handle it without burnout. Many men have left the pulpit because they just plain burned out. Loneliness is to be expected because a leader lives in no man's land. Did you realize that? He's between identifying himself with his people and being isolated from them. A pastor friend of mine told me one time, said, you know, I would love to be with this person or that person more, but it looks like favoritism, so I have to separate myself more. And it's true. And a leader is forced to make unpleasant decisions. You can't please everybody at one time. You must take the stand that's right with the Lord. Every decision, by the very nature of what a decision is, has a degree of finality and ex excludes the possibility of continuing to consider other options. Rejection comes to every leader. Every normal, well-adjusted person wants to be liked, but you can be sure that a leader is not always going to be liked. I don't care if it's a Christian leader, a political leader, it doesn't matter. Or a coach of a ball team. They're not always liked. You know, many issues are clear-cut because the Bible speaks about them and it speaks of them in clarity. Most of my struggles in leadership have come when decisions have to be made which are made because there's a lot of difference of opinion. But to do nothing indefinitely would have ended up in a negative course of action. So a leader, just as Joshua, needs to bring the people to a decision and not everyone reaches the decision at the same time. That's why I say he's vulnerable now. The third quality of leadership that we see in Joshua is he's able to delegate responsibility, but at the same time he doesn't have his authority usurped. Joshua worked through the administrative structure that had been set up earlier during Moses' leadership. So he commanded the officers of the people to carry the word out through the nation that within three days they would be passing over the Jordan. These men are, are trained for their responsibility and they're given responsibility and they're to carry that out, that responsibility. Now fourth, a leader who is qualified to lead has a plan of action. He deals in action. Not, not just slogans. And his leadership is not cosmetic. We like slogans. that It helps us because it puts something in your mind that you can remember. It's like our church a -thon. It's in your mind. So you pass out the tracks and the DVDs and CDs and all those things, devotionals. And on the second Sunday of the month, there's a little plate over here offering the missionaries. Slogan, but it has to be an action. You have to do those things for it to work. And Joshua, as any good leader, commanded the people three things. The Israelites were to prepare. They would prepare their provisions because the manna was not going to be provided when they crossed the Jordan. They had to have food ready. They were coming into a land where there was food. But the, the conquest is coming. 
and they had to provide for themselves until they could get those natural resources. You know, God only provides supernatural resources when natural provisions are not sufficient. Now, I know there are a lot of religions out there and cults who emphasize myths and fables and the supernatural and name it and claim it type things, but throughout the Bible, we do see that God occasionally functions in supernatural ways. But that's not the primary stress of Scripture. For example, when Peter was in prison, the chains were loosed by an angel and he was led out of incarceration. He was out of jail. God intervened supernaturally at the point of a specific need. But if you look back at Scripture, something else you have to take hold of. And that's the fact that when God released Peter, He didn't give him a magic carpet and put him on it and send him over to the house of the believers, Peter had to make his way through the city of Jerusalem to that house. God released him, but then, okay, get there. You see, divine energy always stimulates activity. It never lulls one to sleep. You notice that when Peter was released, he didn't say, well, this is wonderful. I think I'll go over here and have a sandwich and take a nap. He did. He was active. Now the second thing the Israelites were supposed to do were to pass over the Jordan. That was Joshua's plan of action. Prepare and pass over. And then they were to possess the land that God had given them. God had given a promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob that they would have possession of the promised land. And the action now was to pass over the Jordan and to do that job. See, the same thing we have. We're to prepare. The leader said, you prepare. Now, I can't prepare you. So what? What I can teach, but you have to learn. I can preach, you have to listen. I can prepare so much, but you have to do the rest. The people, you know, Joshua said, you tell the people, prepare. If they didn't prepare when they crossed it, they're going to be hungry. We have to prepare. We prepare by reading the Word, studying the Word, believing the Word and praying. We're prepared to cross over, to get out into the world. We pass over pass and give the Word of God. How do you give the Word of God? You're prepared to do so. And we're going to possess the land. The land's already out. You know, we have our promised land. It's not Israel. It's heaven. God's promised us that. Now we've looked a little bit at the leadership. I, I did this so you can see how the leader functions. But now we need to see the reaction of the people, the followers. What about them? You know, a leader can give commands. The leader can do things. What do the people do? Joshua's account gives us a profile of a people who are mobilized for action. There are two characteristics which stand out for me. One, we see the people mobilized for action must be willing to give up personal self-interest for the good of the others. Yep. They are to do this, but it's easier said than done, isn't it? To put away your own self-interest for the good of somebody else. You know, the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh had already been given land on this side of the Jordan. They were beginning to settle in. They had looked at the pasture land and it was good for the flocks and herds and they're getting comfortable. They found the region a good place. And they certainly could have told those other nine and a half tribes, you have enough manpower to do the job. We've got to stay here. They could have been like many people today and make excuses. Well, you know, we have to stay here and watch over our, our wives and our children and our flocks and our herds. We can't leave them unprotected. But you know, the loyalty to honor commitment and to keep your word is a noble quality. Just as negligence is a miserable shortcoming. The point hint is that the ones who had already been provided for didn't forget the ones who were not yet settled. They had promised they would go and aid in this battle. And so those two and a half tribes assisted those in need at great personal sacrifice. It would have been easy to stay at home. See, this story is a biblical testimony against selfishness. 
It's a statement of brotherhood. It speaks of loyalty and attests to the public spirit that's to be ours as believers in Jesus Christ. Caring one for another. Having a burden for our brothers and sisters. Sharing others' burdens. See, this demonstrates the importance of being obedient to the command of God. Just as those tribes were to obey the commands of Joshua, their leader, it's important for us to be obedient to the commands of God. There's nothing which destroys a Christian community, a church family, faster than petty individual self-interests. I want, I demand, I want my way. It's my way or the highway, and it tears a family apart, and the world sees that. Petty self-interest can happen even within the closest church family. For example, there may be some who want to advocate world missions to the neglect of home missions. But you know, there are people in this country that need to hear the gospel. You know, there are people in our country who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet some people think that, oh, we don't need it here. We need to send them somewhere else. And then there's some who, who say, no, we don't need to send them overseas. We need to keep them all here. And there's some people, sadly, that reject the idea of missions altogether. Some em emphasize evangelism to the neglect of Christian nurture. And some stress nurture over evangelism. Some see the gospel in terms of spiritual salvation. Others in the transformation of society but what rips the fabric of a church apart is when one self-interest group defines ministry in its own terms without seeking the gospel in all of its wholeness we have individual gifts and we have individual interests that enrich the whole church family but it's only when we are willing to place our self desires aside for the welfare of the church and the church family that we see success. You know, it's really exciting for me sometimes when I see the New Testament principles so beautifully demonstrated in the Old Testament. God's Word just, it's, just goes together so perfectly from Genesis to Revelation. You know, this is a historical event in the life of Israel, but it gives us an opportunity to see the fact that there's no room for <coughs> excuse me, selfishness within the church. Believers, we're family. And you and I, at best, learn to get along right here and now because we're going to be family for a long, long time. Eternity is a long time. Might as well get used to your family now. You know, we're called to be sensitive to the needs of widows and orphans. Those believers who are older and that, like most of us, you don't retire from spiritual effort because your children have grown. We invest ourselves continually in the lives of future generations. If we don't, who will? If we don't continue to give the gospel, your children are grown, well, I don't need to do anything. I don't need to teach Sunday school anymore. I don't need to do Bible school anymore. I don't need to worry about those. Somebody else will do it. Who do we know is going to do it? We have to continue on. Think about those little ones growing up today. They need to hear about Jesus Christ and the salvation He freely gives. If not, who will? And can you imagine growing up in the world today? You know, I... I look out in our neighborhood, I don't see children outside playing. Very seldom. And I just don't, you have places to play and, you know, we grew up, I guess, in a more innocent time. I don't know. I mean, there was crime and there was violence and things, but not like today. I would hate to have to bring a child up in the world today. But we still have the obligation to give them the gospel. We must continue regardless of our age to work for the cause of Christ. How much value can we put on a soul? What is, what is the value of one soul? It's priceless. Every soul matters. Doesn't matter where they live, what color they are, 
what nationality, every soul is precious. And every soul matters. And it's our job to present the gospel to them. Sadly, it's not uncommon for someone who's worked tirelessly over the years to sit back and say, I've done my part. Let the newer ones do the work now. I've got a question. Where are the newer ones going to come from if we don't teach them the gospel and give them the gospel now? There won't be any new ones. We can't stop. You know, we, maybe we feel we've fulfilled our responsibility. I think back to those people who taught me in Sunday school. They didn't have to be there on Sunday morning with dealing with all the little kindergarten and first grade and second grade as we moved up. They didn't have to take time to take us swimming or to play ball. They did. And Bible schools and all those things. If they hadn't done it, where would I be today? All the messages that came from them, they didn't quit. And they were very old people. You know, when you're five and six, everybody's very old. They never quit. But this biblical model we find here in Joshua alerts us to the importance of placing our personal self-interest aside for the good of the entire community of believers and for us, the cause of Christ. You know, pastors should model their, this lifestyle for their congregation. Look at it this way. On one hand, we reach into the pocket and we support the ongoing work of Christ's church. And we do that. With the other hand, we reach into a pocket, the equity pocket, the, the capital God has given us to help us to support, to support those special projects in a specific way. For us, it's missions. You know, we give to the church. We give to missions. We do those things. And praise the Lord, over my years here, I've seen this time and time again. You know, a pastor doesn't need to make apology for sharing with his people what tasks God has assigned him to do. Christians, we have to communicate to the, to the entire enterprise which God has given us to accomplish. Secondly, a people mobilized for action will be willing to be united in a common task following its God-given leadership. Listen to what they say. All that thou hast commanded us, we will do. And whithersoever thou send us, we will go. They're ready at that moment. You know, this emphasizes clearly the importance of the unity of a church family. Now we're talking about Israel. I'm not trying to say this is the church. It's Israel. But as you bring it up to us, it's a unity in the church. When I'm talking about unity, I'm not talking about ecumenicalism. I'm not talking about throwing our doctrine out the window so we can bring these people in with their doctrine. We, we are united together in belief and doctrine and desire in Bible study. That's the unity. As witnesses for Jesus Christ, we are given the excellent example here of how God's enterprise is more effectively accomplished <clears throat> when God's people in all their diversity and all their differences are bound together by a common purpose. For Israel, it was, we're going to cross the Jordan and take that promised land. For us, it's go. We have the same command. Go ye therefore into all the world. We have to go. And we need to do it in a unified manner to take that gospel out there. You know, Moses was dealing with a huge company of mavericks during his 40 years in the wilderness. The only point that we see any unity that enabled the people to receive God's promises is now. Moses is gone. Moses never saw this type of unity in those years he was with Israel for 40 it's only at this point. And I don't think we can emphasize that too strongly. The church must have unity if it is to be used. We must have one common purpose, the cause of Christ, if we're going to be used. Thank God for the varieties of styles and, and temperament of the people. But we have to have that goal. 
There must be a common task. There must be a passion that motivates that common task. Our common task is twofold. First, we're to grow in the Lord. We do this by studying His Word. When we study, we grow. Then it becomes easier to witness. Thereby it leads us to the second task. Send the Gospel out into the world. Yes, we support missions all over the world, but we need to remember that we are commanded to give the Gospel of Christ ourselves. We are a Christ-centered, independent Baptist church committed to leading men and women and children to the personal faith in Jesus Christ. We can't save anybody. I can't save you. You can't save anybody. But we are commanded to give the Gospel of Christ because He can save them. We can lead them to Calvary. We can give them the Word of God. We're to be nurturing and growing in our love for Christ. We are to, we're also committed to deploying our resources, personal resources and financial in the service ministries and servant ministries and missions and whatever we have. There must be a unified goal. And whatever those goals are, they must be kept in clear focus. We talked about being in tune with the Lord. Now we have to be focused Remember those old TV sets back in the 50s? You had to get the rolling and you had to get this way. If you, there was no focus if you didn't get it right. We need to be focused on what God has for us. You all know that how I feel about the mission of the church's missions. I make no qualms about it. The sense of that task must be felt with such deep conviction that we're willing to die for it. It's that important. We must be just like Jesus. We must be that strong in our witness. I know it's a strong statement, but I mean that. It's that important. We must be open to God's leadership and how He expresses His will through those as He's installed as His leaders. In the case of Israel, it was Joshua and the various officers that would under Him that would lead into the conquest of the land. The church today must be open to the leadership of God and remind ourselves that God expresses His will through those He has installed as leaders. We need to level with people who are called to lead. If we can show them from this somewhat unusual moment in the life of Israel, what can happen when God's people are united in a common task and willing to follow their God-given leadership? Compare that with the times when Israel was unwilling to do so. Consider churches you may have seen that have been blessed by God when they've been responsive to their leaders, but they paid a severe price when they've and splintered when they went out on the, with their own personal interests and conceits. Israel had come to a new day, and they were prepared to give to Joshua what they never gave Moses, uncomplaining loyalty. Now, all of Israel pledged to Joshua, according as we hearken unto Moses in all things, so we hearken unto thee, only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. You know, as I get older, my memory gets shorter. Israel had the same memory problem. Their memory was short. They had forgotten all the rebellious things that they had done against Moses. Now, as we followed Moses, they didn't follow Moses, did they? Not all the time. Oh, we'll do it. And of course, they're speaking the truth here. We'll follow you just the way we did Moses. There's going to be rebellion. There's going to be problems. But right now they're unified. You know, Moses' story is one of unanswered affection. He loved the people, but they murmured and grumbled against him. I don't know. Moses loved them so much. Lord, take my life. Blot my name out of it. But save them. 
now they've learned their lesson. At least this generation. This new generation is going, they've learned a lesson for now. We're going to find their memories a little short too. Forty years of wilderness wandering had taken the inevitable toll in attrition. That generation who refused to go with the exception of Joshua and Caleb were now gone. They knew that the only way they could accomplish anything for God was to be a united people and willing to follow their leadership. So they pledged their loyalty in a united way to Joshua and in turn, they expected him and the rest of the leadership to be what? Loyal to God. I want you to know that the world laughs at a divided church. They cheer. The devil cheers at a church split. He loves it. You don't think of the devil loving anything? A church splitting, a church closing, he loves that. But the world admires a people that differs in age, with different temperaments, and dress, and economics, and political ideology, but that has oneness rooted in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Even the lost world sees and respects that. Of course, in that, the devil hates. If the devil is not attacking your church, something's wrong. And that's, that's wrong. If he's leaving a church alone, you're not accomplishing the for Christ. He doesn't have time to fool with you. They're on my side. But if you're doing anything, if you're reaching out to missions, reaching out to people, He's going to attack. And he's going to do everything He can to destroy you. There are two kinds of Christian communities that I've noticed over the years. One are like seagulls made up of loners. You're only safe if you, as an individual, have got it together. If you're wounded, you're left to take care of yourself. You ever know it? That's the way seagulls are. But the other are like Canadian geese. You ever see Canadian geese? We'll see some here pretty soon, flying through the air. They're a different kind of bird. They help each other as they fly. They take turns in the lead position, cutting through the air interference and creating a draft that makes it easier for the others to fly. No one ever drops out alone. If one, geese goes, one goose goes down, if he's injured, he's stranded, another one goes and nurses him back to health, stays with him. It's the unified community that does not encourage superstar status. The story is told of, it's not a true story, just a story of a man who died and he appeared at the gates and that was St. Peter. You know, of course, that's not true. St. Peter's not going to welcome you at the pearly gates. You're going to be there with Jesus Christ. But the story goes, this fellow died and went to the pearly gates and there's St. Peter. And he asked <coughs> Peter if he could take a look at heaven and hell. So Peter took him to a large banquet room of people sitting at a tremendous table with all this finely prepared food. And then he took him to another large banquet room. And it was the same way, everything, all this food and all. So the man saw people there eating that wonderfully prepared food. The man was confused. He asked St. Peter, said, which one of those rooms was heaven and which one is hell? They looked the same to me. So St. Peter said, Let's go back and you look a little more carefully at each room. The man looked at the first room. He noted that the only eating utensil on the table was a long, sharp sword in both rooms. In one room, people were selfishly stabbing at the food and they were cutting themselves trying to get it into their, their mouths before the person next to them. And, and it was really a, a terrible mess. And in the other room, he saw people who had learned to pierce the food and politely hand it to their friends and neighbors sharing what they had. You see, hell was filled with a room of people determined to do things their own way. But they ended up nothing but a bloody mangled mess. Heaven was a, a room of unity, 
love and loyalty. That's not a true story, but it is a picture of how the church can be. The church can either be made up of people who are out for themselves and nothing else, including Christ, or they can be people who love one another, nurture one another, and want to spread the gospel. A people mobilized for action is important. It involves the interaction of qualified leadership, unselfish persons with a unified common goal, and that's Jesus Christ. That's what we need. We need to be led like Joshua led, and we need to be unified in the goal that God has called us to be. Our goal is what? Go into the world and preach the gospel. We need to be unified in that as a church family. That's our goal. That was my plan from day one. We've seen that in action now. And I want it to keep growing. And I want us to reach the world. And I want to keep hearing those reports of people coming to salvation. But I want to hear them coming to salvation here in Montvale and in Bedford County and in Roanoke County and in Virginia. I want to see people saved. That is our unified goal. And as I pray, I hope it's your goal too. Let's be unified in this action for the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we have turned Joshua's passing over the Jordan into the Promised Land to our passing through these doors and giving the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, it's a plan that's now action. And I pray that you would work in every heart that we could be unified in this. That we have a desire to see this come to pass. That we put away our self-interests. Maybe we'd like to see more missions in this area or that area, but put away that and just pray that people are saved. I don't know about the hearts here this morning. I don't know. I take people's word that they're saved or unsaved. I don't know. But if there's one here this morning who's not saved or not sure of their salvation, I pray that right now the Holy Spirit is working in their hearts and that they would have no peace until they make the decision you would have them to make. Father, thank you for those who have come out today. Bless and keep them. And I thank you for the blessings you bestowed us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.